Um, all right, guys, a lot of us come to God and we wonder, Man, what's, your, what's your will for my life? What do you want from me? What, where am I supposed to go? What's my direction? A lot, of us, a lot of us don't have the answers and just, just wonder, what's this big question that God wants me? Where does he want me in my life? And uh, <laughs> God, uh, <laughs> a lot of, yeah. all right, here we go, perfect. <laughs> um, we ask the, these simple questions like, God, what, what do you want from me? Where do I want to go? What's my purpose? And there's this big God, whether you're a Christian or not. I feel like if we're, from, we're Christians, we, th- we look to God, and he's obviously the big guy. He's, he's the one we look at. But if we're not, we say, what does this God have for me? And here's my challenge to you today. If you're not a Christian, you came here just because you were guilted or curiosity or for class credit or something. I want, I want you to realize, man, there, maybe there is this God. Just come with me today and just accept that maybe, maybe there is this God. You don't have to accept it. Maybe you don't walk away today believing in this God. But just for the rest of my sermon, just think, hey, if there was this bigger God, someone who created everything, who's more powerful, who wants a relationship with me, who wants to make my life better, why wouldn't I want to hang out with him and know what he wants for my life? Now, I understand that a lot of times we can't understand what God has for us. We just can't. We're not as big as God. We don't understand everything that God understands. But right now, we can, we can come to God and say, God, I, I want to know what you want for me. So for right now, I'm going to talk about today the way that God speaks to us. And so we don't have to hope and luck and pray that maybe I roll the dice and I get where God wants me to be. Or, man, if, I, if God did, it didn't work out how I thought God wanted it to, then I guess I did the wrong thing. But God in the Bible talks to us. It's this, it's this easy way to talk to us and say, here's what I want for you guys. So I'm going to start out and just pray. God, I wish, I pray that today that you be here, that you speak through me, and that you bring clarity to these people. God, that you just bring a vision of what you want, and God, a vision of where you want us to be. All right, I'm excited. I didn't grow up in church. I don't know if a lot of you guys know that, but the first church I started going to was an amazing, amazing church, and obviously they preached from the Bible which is a great thing, and <clears throat> if you guys are going to a church that doesn't preach from the Bible, it's a little sketchy and you should probably leave because it's probably a cult. But the one thing that they didn't do is give me a method to the madness once I accepted Jesus of how to read my Bible. And so I, I, I approached it like a book report, and I thought, okay, God, I'm going to start from the beginning. And so I opened it up, and in Genesis 1, all right, God created. Okay, this sounds cool. And whether you're a Christian or not, you know, okay, God created, and there's Adam and Eve. Eve told Adam, and they messed up, and they were naked. Okay. So that's kind of cool, and you're like, okay, this is kind of boring, I get all this. You skip on to Noah, and you're like, okay, the world got flooded. I've also heard about this. I wasn't a Christian before, and I had never gone to Sunday school, but, man, I've heard about Noah before, whatever. So I'll skip forward, and I get to these genealogies, and so begot, so begot, so begot, so begot, so. And so I'm reading this like a book report, and I'm thinking, man, these parts are getting kind of boring, so I'm going to skip for a while, get to some sacrifices that are kind of weird, so I'm going to skip over those, too. And eventually get to Proverbs, and I'm like, okay, I can land here. So I guess like Confucius was Christian, and I can just kind of read what he was saying, and the wisdom's good, and here's some witty little comments. And after, after Proverbs, I'm like, okay, these are pretty good. God's got maybe some good stuff to say. They're kind of catchy, whatever. And then they start skipping some more, and you're like, whoa, whoa, wait a second. It got red. That must be important. So you stop at the red words, and you're like, man, this must be important. So you stop in Matthew, and you're like, okay, I'll read Matthew. So you read Matthew, and you read about, oh, okay, this is what the pastor was talking about. And Jesus did some miracles, and it was really cool. These are the things I hear about on Sunday. And then, oh, he died. But then he raised again, and we're all saved, yada, yada, yada. And then you get done with Matthew, you're like, okay, I'm encouraged. I'm going to keep reading Mark. <coughs> oh, shoot. Wait, did not just read it? Like, it's, it's one of those moments where you think you fell asleep a little bit, and then you wake up, and you're like, okay, well, maybe I was zoned out, but I feel like I've read all this before. Jesus is the same guy, and he's doing some more miracles, so... Okay, so I'm going to skip over and go to Luke, and, and you're like, wait, it's the same Jesus guy again, doing the same miracles. And you, and you go to John, and you're like, this has got to be plagiarism. I guess plagiarism was cool in their day. It's not a big deal. Like, I just, I don't understand why they're just repeating the same thing over. I don't think there were four Jesuses, but here we go. So you skip to the end, like any good book report, you skip to the last chapter. And you realize, okay, if I get the end part, I'll realize what the whole story was about and everything. So you start in the first verse of Revelation, and you go, okay, God, um, what's this about? So there's a dragon with some horns and seven seals of serpents. And 
So you close it up and you say, I read the Bible cover to cover. I got it. I got the Bible on lock. If anyone asks me if I've read the Bible, I can say, yes, I got the main ideas. It was started with Adam, Jesus came, and then Revelation was really weird. But at the end, I got what the Bible was trying to tell me. And today, I think if you guys have been around the church for a while, you realize, man, this is, this is not the way to read the Bible. And a lot of times this word devotions is thrown around a lot. And when I was growing up, I didn't know what devotions were. And it, was, it wasn't until a couple of years ago, after I'd been saved for a long time, I'd heard devotions a lot, but didn't know what it was about. And it was funny, one of my pastors, we were all hanging out in a group, and he just said, okay, guys, we're, let's just break for a little bit. i got to go to a meeting. You just do devotions. And I was like, what? Do what? I'm sorry. He's like, devotions. devotions. You just do your devotions. And I was like, uh, I, don't, I don't really know what devotions are. And it was just like, everyone in the crowd was like, what? You don't know what devotions are? You've never, you've never done devotions? It's just like, get in the Word and read. I was like, oh, okay, it's just reading your Bible. So if you guys have your notes in front of you, we're going to start filling out the notes and start filling out the outline. And the first point, this is the main point that I want you guys to get today, is uh, reading and prayer are essential to accurately interpreting God's will for our lives. Reading and prayer are essential to accurately interpreting God's will for our lives. The first one, obviously reading, they're both underlined, so those are the main ideas. The reading and prayer today are what ideally I'm going to be talking about. And reading for us is reading our Bibles from a Christian perspective. This is reading your Bible. It's getting in the Word. It doesn't matter where you start or if you understand it completely, I'm guaranteeing you that it's going to start working out in your lives. And from a Christian perspective, there's two things that we need to understand before we start getting into why do devotions and all those things and start unpacking it more. There's two main factors that are on your outline that you need to understand from a Christian perspective. Fact one, the Bible is God's complete written word. Again, the Bible is God's complete written word. After that, it says, it represents all that God wanted to communicate directly to humanity and how to live within his truth. A lot of times we think, man, the Bible addresses some things, but God doesn't understand the relationship that I'm in. God doesn't, God doesn't talk specifically about my girlfriend right now and what to do when, she, when we get in a fight together. He doesn't talk about what to do when my parents are angry at me. He doesn't talk about how I should navigate certain things in my life. He doesn't talk about bullying in school. So God doesn't, God doesn't know what I'm, what I'm going through. And the thing is, the, the, we as Christians understand this is, compl- this is the complete word of God. And that though God doesn't maybe address certain things in your life, he's going to address principles that you can take into different areas of your life. Fact number two, the Bible is authoritative in every area of faith and life that it addresses. Authoritative in every area of faith and life that it addresses. After that, it says, there may be things in the Bible that we cannot understand, but if we take this teaching seriously, we can accept it with all sincerity, humility, and obedience. This is to say, if you're a Christian, you've got to live out what's in this Bible. This is, this is our goal. This is, like I said in the beginning, we have all these questions, and why am I here for, and what's my, what's my point in life? This is the answer right here. This is where we're going to find our answers. And so if we accept God's word as authoritative, and these are things that we need to take seriously, it's going to make all these next points really come to life. And so the first, the first kind of sub-point I want to talk about underneath reading and prayer as the essentials that we need to talk about, kind of why we need to do devotions. Why do we even need to think about these as, as things that God wants us to do? And the first one is, when we read God's word, it's our way of showing God that we want to listen. The blanks are showing God that we want to listen. The most frustrating thing for me is it's one of my biggest pet peeves is when I'm trying to engage with somebody and you know they're not in the conversation. You know they're zoned out, whether they're thinking about something at home or they're focused on who they're going to talk to next and they really don't pay attention to what you're trying to say. And the biggest, the biggest time this happens to me is when I'm talking to little kids. And little kids are in their own little fantasy world. And they don't really know what's going on. They're never really engaged with you. They're never on point with you. And you just feel like picking up and just shaking them and say, pay attention, pay attention to what I have to say. Because I know this is going to help. And maybe you probably shouldn't shake kids. But hey, that's just what goes through my mind. We all have sinful impulses, right? Um, so you just pick up and you want to just shake the kid to get their attention. And so many times I feel like that's what God wants to do in our lives. We just, we go, God, what do you want us to do? We pray and we just wonder. And God just wants to pick us up and shake us and say, read my word. If you really want to listen to me and really want to follow me, read my word. I've already written it down for you. It's right there. It's in English. It's right there for you. And uh, the Bible verse that I have for this is John 8, 31 and 32. 
This is Jesus talking to the Jews. And he says, Jesus said, if you hold to my teaching, you are really my disciple. Then you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. This is something so huge. And if this is God, Jesus is pretty much saying, if you're not listening to my teachings, how can you say that you're a Christian? How can you say that you're a Christ follower if you're not getting into the word and really devoting yourself to what it has to say? The second big point, reading the Bible is like going to the grocery store. You always walk away with things you didn't expect. This is it's right on your outline. It's the second point. Reading the Bible is like going to the grocery store. You always walk away with things you didn't expect. I don't know about you guys, but I don't really try and make lists when I go to the grocery store, because even if I do, it doesn't really work. I'm the type of guy that goes up and down every single aisle and just and is wondering, like, hey, what do I need? And I'm super indecisive. And I don't know if any of you guys are like me, but I walk down every single aisle wondering, man, do I really need this? I, I pick something off the shelf, and I look at it for a bit. And I say, well, I don't know if I need it or not. So I, I maybe I'll put it in the cart, and I'll go back down. I'll get something better, so I'll have to go back and put it back. And it just takes forever. I'm very indecisive. But when I go to the grocery store, even if I go in wanting, okay, I'm going to get milk today, and that's all I want, I'll end up walking out with milk and bread, and I'll see something from the snack aisle that I really wanted, and I'll walk out and just be like, how did I get all these things when I just went to the store to get milk? Does anyone else have that? Does anyone else do that in their life? Okay, awesome. I'm not the only one then. Good. And so we walk out, and I think it's the same way when we approach God's Word. We need to approach it with an attitude that, God, maybe I'm not feeling reading the Word today. Maybe I'm not feeling like doing this today, but I really need to dive into this because I know it's going to change me. And the craziest part is, I will guarantee you, I will guarantee you that if you start reading the word, you're going to come out and be like, man, I didn't even know that was, that was in there. I didn't even know that I was going to draw this out of the word. I didn't know that God was going to talk to me about humility. I didn't know, I didn't know that was going to be such a big struggle in my life. And God will begin to reveal things through the word that you didn't even expect, but I guarantee you, you needed. You didn't expect them, but I guarantee you needed them. My third point guys are following with me on the outline the bible bible reading plans often end up like new year's resolutions how many of you guys have ever made new year's resolutions that are just crazy how many of you guys have ever said i guarantee i've said this a million times i'm gonna start working out this year i'm gonna i'm just gonna get for me i'm just gonna get stacked i'm just gonna get yoked this year that's gonna be my goal i'm gonna weigh like 250 by the end of this year just because i go to the gym every day and i'm working out every day and i used to work at a gym and they used to always have sales and stuff like that. And they used to always talk about, man, how many people are going to come in between the second, because these are the gyms closing on the first, to the second to the end of January signing up for gym memberships. And it's crazy. Every time you'd guess at people and be like, he's never been in a gym before. And guarantee you, you won't see him in February. <laughs> guarantee you won't see him in February. They'll start with like a really good deal, but you'll sign a year contract. And everyone's like, yeah, I'm going to be here for the whole year. And you won't, you'll see them maybe twice for the rest of the year. And a lot of times I feel like we do that with our Bible reading plans. When we'll say, God, I'm going to read my Bible for the rest of the year. We get hyped after a message or a retreat or a camp or whatever we go to. And we say, God, I'm yours. I'm reading your word. I'm going to dive into it. And for the first week, you're, okay, I'm reading the word. I'm excited about it. I'm, I'm getting into it. And then class comes along. And you have a big report to do. And you say, okay, I'm not going to read the word today. I just got to do my report. But I'll read double tomorrow. How many of you guys have ever said that? I'm not going to read today, but I'll read like double tomorrow. So it'll like even out. And you end up skipping over the last day, and it just builds up and builds up, and, and start thinking, God, I don't, I'm never going to catch up, so I might as well just bail on it. And a lot of times, science tells us this, that it takes two weeks to two months to form a habit. And I tell you, I'm a lot more on the two-month side of things, to build a habit. But I'm telling you, we need to make Bible reading habitual. We need to make something that we do on a daily basis, that we need to just get focused on. And if we start doing it now, we're going to end up doing it a lot more in our lives. I can guarantee you it's going to be a beneficial way for you to understand God better. My fourth point, my final point, if you guys are following along with me, Bible reading doesn't help us if we don't conclude with application. Bible reading doesn't help us if we don't conclude with application. So many times we read the Bible and we walk away and say, okay, I did it. Check. I checked it off my list. I did it. I've done for today. I've read